Today we're starting this series of messages entitled, What is the Holy Spirit? And as we lay a foundation for this message, let us remember one very important thing, that without the correct preparation to receive the Holy Spirit, there is no way to retain the Spirit within you. The Holy Spirit can and will come as we seek after Him. But the question is, when He comes, will you be a place or will there be a place in you where He can dwell? There is so much being taught today among Christian religions as to what the Holy Ghost is. How do you receive the Holy Ghost? How do you know that you have the Holy Ghost? What will it do in your life once you receive it? What is the evidence of the Holy Ghost? Is it speaking with tongues or a certain gift? Or is it the fruits of the Spirit? As we find in Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When we talk about fruit, we talk about a tree. And in the Bible, there are many places that types man as a tree, as we find in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 20. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So by the fruits, you will know them. In Christianity today, you have those that teach that the evidence of the Holy Ghost is the fruits of the Spirit. Another group says that the evidence of the Holy Spirit is speaking in an unknown tongue or some gift. I am saying these things for our children that are growing up and for the new people that are coming to the Lord. But we know that the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit can be imitated or perverted. So what does the Spirit quicken to bring the genuine gifts and fruits? The Word of God. Then the evidence of the Holy Spirit is when you can punctuate every word with an amen, which means so be it. Also, our messenger told us, when you can see your life lining up with God's word, that's another evidence. And when you can see your life lining up with God's word, then the fruits and gifts in your life will prove what kind of tree you are. Let's break this down a little more. We've talked about fruit and trees. How will you know that the tr that tree by the fruit it produces? Now let's talk about the birth of that tree. Before, before there is fruit, you have to have a tree. To have a tree, there has to be a birth of that tree. And before there can be a birth, there has to be a seed planted and watered in order for that tree to grow and bear fruit. Right here is where the religions of the world today are so confused. They don't have a clear understanding of how to prepare themselves to receive not just the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but the infilling or indwelling 
of the Holy Ghost. The seed of their teaching has been perverted by modernism. I want to say that again. The seed of their teaching has been perverted by modernism. They truly do not understand the true new birth. And without the true new birth, you have nothing to receive the Holy Ghost with. 1 Peter 1, starting with verse 18. For so much as you know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, first of all, without understanding the redemptive work of the blood of Christ and where the Holy Spirit proceeded forth from, then you do not understand why you need to receive the Holy Spirit. Let's explain this a little bit. Jesus was the Word of God made flesh, right? And the Father came and indwelled Him. And as we understand the Scriptures, the Father and the Holy Spirit is the same person. So when Jesus bled and died on Calvary, when that blood cell was let loose from his body, it released the Holy Spirit that was within him. His body was taken back up to heaven, and his spirit, the spirit that dwelt in Jesus, was sent back to earth. Later on in this teaching, we'll go to the scriptures that relates this very thing. So we know here then that it's with the precious blood of Christ no longer just the chemistry of his blood, because as a human being, he only had so much blood in his body, just like you and me. And that literal blood, it spilt out upon the ground and dried up. But the spirit that proceeded forth or came from that blood is what we receive today. That is the Holy Spirit. Let's go to verse 20 who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. I want you to notice how the scripture says it, it was manifest in these last times for you. You know, the word you can be a very general thing and mean a group of people, but what we are after today is for you as an individual to put your name there. That it... It was foreordained, this lamb was, before the foundation of the world, but it was manifest in these last times for you. You've got to understand that this is a promise to you. Otherwise, why would you want to receive it? Verse 21. Who by him do we believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing that you have purified your soul's and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word. I want you to notice how the Holy Spirit through Peter here is putting this all in present tense. It says, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is, not was, not will be, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Very tremendous scripture. Notice the word here in verse 21. It says, being born again. That word being is a word that has a beginning but it's a, it continues. It's not, well, he was born or will be born. 
But being born again, it has a beginning, but it's not all done at once. It continues until you are fully born. But brother, now, how by a corruptible seed? How does this seed become corruptible? And when is the seed incorruptible? It's by the word of God that it, it can retain this purity of not being corrupt. It's by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So being that the word is that seed, what can corrupt that seed? Let's go to verse that verse 25 again in the same chapter. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Notice the incorruptible seed. That's the only thing that will endure forever. Because as you know, when you mix a seed and natural life of a plant and you hybrid it, it can no longer produce the original seed. It has a time span set to it to where it can produce the seed that it is. But the word of the Lord, when it's maintained in its purity, it will endure forever. Notice the incorruptible seed. And this is presently the word by the gospel, which is preached to you. You see, the first and original ministry of preaching the word by the gospel was before anyone else could put their own ideas to it. You know, in Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 20, it says that we are built on that foundation of the apostles and prophets. Watch where the seed begins to corrupt or to be perverted into another seed, and that seed will bring a false birth. Now, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. You may wonder, what does this have to do with the Holy Spirit? And the preparation of the Holy Spirit. We don't want a birth of a religion. We, we don't want just another church gore. We want the original believers, just like they were in the book of Acts. When God first spoke his word through his apostles and prophets. And brought that original baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what we want today. Not just a little portion, not just an ism, not just a gift, not just a fruit. We want the fullness of God's word, which was the seed that could produce the true baptism of the Holy Ghost. So until you can get to this point in your life, there's no way for you to really take advantage of receiving the Holy Spirit. What good would it do you to know what the Holy Spirit is if you don't know the results it's going to bring in your life, you would have no idea of what you had received when you received it. And if you didn't know what you had received, how would you be able to use what you had received? Or how could God use you by the Holy Spirit to, for a specific purpose? So it's very, very important to understand what the Holy Spirit is. And to understand the preparation. The preparation, what is it? It's an experience where you come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a sinner, condemned to hell. All of us were. Condemned by our own actions, by our own unbelief. Because true sin, it's not smoking and drinking and carousing around and partying. No. True sin it sounds horrible to say it that way. True sin is unbelief, right? The reason people do those things is because they do not believe. And why do they do those things? It's because the seed of their spiritual life is corrupt. So we must understand today in this world of religion that we live, many, many, many different churches, thousands probably of different Denominations, each teaching something different or each teaching just a, a portion of God's word. 
and relating that the Holy Spirit is received just by accepting the Lord in your heart. And when you accept the Lord in your heart, then you receive the Holy Spirit. Well, in principle, that might be fine. But it's so sad to say that it's not, that's not the way it is. But now let's see where the seed begins to be perverted. Let's go to First Peter, as, or Second Peter, as I said, chapter 1, and we're going to start. Let's go back to verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Can you imagine such a thing to be an eyewitness? These first and founding apostles at this point, when they went up on the mount, they were just called disciples, which is a follower. But after they received the Holy Spirit and were sent of God, they became the apostles. For the word apostle, one of the meanings is a sent one. And you imagine hearing that voice speak. In the, on the mountain. But watch this now. From that it changes. And it says in verse 19. We also. Are more. We also have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well to take heed. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn. And the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first. I want to stop there. Knowing this first. First things must be put first. How many, when you went to school, the first thing they taught you was how to count from 1 to 10? And how they taught you your ABCs? It, I want to make it so simple that even a child could understand it. But we must take first things first. And here's God telling us about this of the word and how it came. And he goes, first. That's the thing that's first. Knowing this first, verse 20, that the no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see where the seed has been corrupted? That's why we have so many different churches today and the people don't know what to do. Now in verse 21, it gives us the key to know and receive the incorruptible seed. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Did you catch that? It didn't come by the will of man in the past, trying to interpret the word. But each of these holy men in his time or age spake which at that time, it was present. It wasn't a thing from the past. It wasn't a thing that was going to be in the future. But it was in their present time. They spake, present tense, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So today, after man has corrupted the seed, what would it take to restore the original seed back to the way it was when it was spoke the first time. For truly God's spoken word is the original seed. It would require a holy man. Not holy in himself. 
but the Holy Spirit moving in him to speak the pure, incorruptible seed word of God. These men were and are God's prophets. That's why we have a Bible today. That's why we believe that God sent a prophet to our day to restore the original seed word by bringing the correct interpretation of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Taking the totality of God's word in its continuity to finish the mystery of God in this last age so we can go in the catching away or what we call the rapture. Now as we approach the first scripture that the prophet used to open his message on what is the Holy Ghost, let's review what we've talked about and apply another scripture, actually several other scriptures, so we can approach this most important subject of what is the Holy Ghost. We talked about how many churches teach that the evidence of having the Holy Ghost is the fruit of the Spirit or gifts such as unknown tongues. But we found out that the evidence of having the Holy Ghost is when we can punctuate with every word of God with an amen. When we can see our life line up with the word of God in its fullness. We talked of man as a tree that brings forth fruit. But then we saw that this tree had to be born first and grow and then produce fruit. We also saw that we have to be born again of the incorruptible seed, the word. So the true new birth is what prepares us to receive the Holy Ghost. That's what I want you to get. If that preparation isn't correct, there is no use of finding out what the Holy Spirit is. It will only dwell in those that are prepared. Now let's go to a scripture that can relate to each one of us. Remember, we are speaking to a wide spectrum of people from many different backgrounds. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 42. And let's start with verse 5. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Here this prophecy is speaking actually of the Messiah himself, that he would be a, a, a light to the Gentiles, which, by the way, most of us that we're talking to on this tape, we're all Gentiles, all right? Watch the purpose of why this light would come to the Gentiles, verse 7. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So how many of us were at one point in our lives, no matter what walk of life we come from, were blind? You might say, well, Brother Jimmy, I, I see very well. You must understand that I'm talking not about a natural blindness. I'm talking about a spiritual condition. That we were blind. We, we, we were totally blind. Blind, if I could say it that way. We, we did not understand one thing about what God was. We did not understand one thing about what God wanted to do in our lives, what the purpose of God would be in our life. And we were in a prison. We were enslaved within our own selves, our own desires, our own sin, our own way of life, our own way of thinking. But he was going to come to open the blind eyes and to bring the prisoners out of prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise 
to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth, I tell you them. Amen. So can you relate that to that today? That you were once blind, as this song says, I was once blind, but now I see. Now let's go to verse 16. I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Aren't you happy for that? So what is this scripture? Why would I bring this scripture in relation to what is the Holy Spirit? Is that really until God reveals to you what the Holy Spirit is, what it was given for, what it will do in your life, you're in this condition. You don't know the way of God. I don't know the way of God. So he has to take us. Notice how the scripture says, I will bring the blind by a way they knew not. That shows that God, from the very time that we were born on this earth, has been dealing with us even though we didn't know what he was doing. He's been bringing us all along. That's why many of you today that will be listening or in the future listening to this podcast on this series, God has brought you to the point. You may not have even understood or understand today why, but you've come to the point where now God can bring you by a way that when you begin, you really did not know how it was happening. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them. What a promise. And crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. Verse 17. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images, that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. Hear ye deaf, look ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I, I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant. That is so hard for the intellectual mind to understand how, what God is talking about. You notice, we miss, we, now we came to him blind, right? But now he's t speaking to the deaf and saying, here. He's speaking to the blind and he's saying, see, that's you and me. No matter where we come from, what race we are, what part of the world we live in, that's you and me. But notice how he changes here, it seems like. Even though he's using the same word, he asks the question, who is blind but my servant? And then the question would be, blind to what? Blind to anything that would lead him away from the Lord. Blind to anything that is contrary to God's word, plan, and purpose. That's the kind of servant that God needs. Somebody that won't follow their own understanding or what the modern ideas of this world are today. Or, or death as my messenger that I sent, how could he be a messenger if, he was, if this was talking about natural deafness? He would not be able to hear the voice of God. But what it is saying is he would be deaf to anything that isn't the voice of God. And that's the way you and I must become. Watch this. Who is blind as he that is perfect and blind 
as the Lord's servant. Isn't that so tremendous? Who is blind but he that is perfect? Why? Because he's not being led by anything except the perfect almighty God. Aren't you all happy for that today? Amen. So, let's go now to chapter 43. Are you being able to relate to this? See, this is part of our preparation. Why would you want the Holy Spirit in your life if you're not going to follow it? If you would follow your own ideas, if you would listen to all the different voices of the world, if you wouldn't learn to get to the point where you were deaf to anything that wasn't God's voice, why would God even give you the Holy Spirit? God is very wise. We all know that. He is the fountain of all wisdom. He's only going to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask for it. But them that ask for it are those that truly desire to walk with him. Let's go here to chapter 43 as we finish this little part here on the, the preparation or the introduction to this message. Chapter 43 of Isaiah, verse 5. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name. Oh, my goodness. We're going to get to something good on that here in a minute. Even those that are called by my name. For I have created him for my glory and have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Here we go again. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes. And the deaf that have ears. Verse 9. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Who can show us the plan of God and what's from the times past to the present and to show us why God is calling us, why God wants to give us the Holy Spirit? that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is the truth. Notice that it says, those that will be justified, it says, let them hear. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing and the hearing by the word of God. Let them say, hear and say it is the truth. Or let them hear and say it is the truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. That's present progressive tense. That's the emphatic variant. Not I was, not I will be. I am. And like when that light that appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and he asked, who will I say sent me? And the light simply answered, I am that I am. And here he's saying in verse 11, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and, and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. What a tremendous thing. So can you see yourself in these scriptures? Can you see that he's calling his sons from every nation under the earth? And he's bringing these blind people from the east, from the west, from the north, to the south, to what? For one purpose, 
and that is to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, it talked about his name, the name of the Lord. And now I would like to read a quote out of the message, the Patmos Vision, preached in 1960. And it's paragraph 132. The greatest of all revelations is the deity, the supreme deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get to first base until you believe that. And here the messenger of the Lord is saying, until you receive a revelation of the supreme deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, you can't even get to first base until you believe that. Now notice, it didn't say that you have to understand everything about it. You must believe that in order to get to first base. That's what Peter said. Repent and see the deity and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and then you are ready to go in the Spirit. Notice, this is the first part of the preparation. The first thing you have to, do, to know is the deity of Christ. I am Alpha and Omega. I am from A to Z. There, there's no more but me. I was at the beginning. I'll be at the end. I am he that was, which is, and shall come the Almighty. Think of it. That's what the trumpet said. Notice it's saying the same thing that, that the book of Isaiah said. He says, I am God. There's no other God that's been formed before me. I alone am God. And here he's saying the same thing. But now in the New Testament, God has revealed to us the name of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that for this first part, I would like to stop here and we will continue on. In the next part, we'll, we'll go into the first scripture uh, that our messenger used to start the message, what is the Holy Spirit?